Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. Chimerian peoples are most distinguished by their long lives, granted by strains of a hereditary magic which act to preserve the bonded host as long as possible. Pregnancy lasts for around three years, and most Chimerians are not considered adults until 80 and fully grown until well into their second century. This has in no small part resulted in a general culture and personal aversion to killing. Warfare still occurs, and many points in Chimerian's history have been especially bloody, but most conflicts are over control of resources, and killing of prisoners or opponents after a formation has been broken is deeply dishonorable. This is contrasted with the many dangerous animals, and most weapons capable of lethal force are at least partly if not primarily designed for combating beasts and demons instead of people. Armor is often designed with this in mind as well. Large pole arms and ranged weapons like bows are the most popular Chimerian weapons. With a slow-growing population insufficient for a robust manufacturing base and lacking a global trade initiative, Chimere has not undergone an industrial revolution. An artisan-based manufacturing system combined with a period of relative peace in the past four centuries means that the arms and armor of Chimere aren't dramatically distinct from weapons of our own history, before the Industrial Revolution. There have been refinements, and their weapons are often of exceptional quality, but they are not produced anywhere near the scale of weaponry on Earth today. Gunpowder is a rare resource and only used in niche application. The few firearms brought to Chimere were novelties most popular during the 1700s amongst nobility, particularly in Qajar. The age of exploration and colonialism on Earth made Chimerians of the free states especially wary of incursion, and the devastation of the Earth world wars have caused the oligarchs to crack down on any smuggling efforts to bring firearms and explosives to the known world. Guns are now mostly museum and private collection pieces. In this episode, we will primarily be exploring the conventional kit of a few culture groups, along with a number of specialists. Perhaps the most widespread melee weapon is the rubberhead. The aversion to killing amongst Chimerians has manifested in the widespread use of weapons that use impact force. Bludgeoning weapons can bruise and break bones to a degree that a foe is incapacitated, but the hereditary magic of Chimerians means that they can usually repair their hosts after such injuries so they are rarely lethal, or having long-term negative effects, whereas blood loss cannot be easily repaired by magic, so cutting weapons tend to have greater chance of killing. Rubberheads are just as the name implies, a club or baton with a lump of rubber at one end. Rubber trees are widespread throughout the northern part of the known world, particularly the Kenturim Islands and Northeastern Empire. The haft is often wood, but can be a range of other materials. Each culture has their own design, usually inspired by the weapons of their culture, but the most common form is a laterally compressed wooden stick that flares out and sports a healthy lump of rubber. As mentioned before, spears and bows are the favored lethal weapons of most Chimerian peoples. In regions with a humid climate, longbows of a single stave are most popular since glues can easily be compromised in a humid climate. In more arid regions, Bows incorporating horn for greater power at more compact size is quite popular. The shoe horn bows of pronghorn antelope on the belly of the bow favored over the horns of other animals as they have especially high tensile strength and durability for compression while still being fairly thin and lightweight, making for a bow that is exceptionally strong yet small and light, ideal for use on horseback. These bows were introduced to Picardia during the Three Spears, the only major military engagement involving the entire known world in recent history. Despite Picardia having a fairly consistent rainy climate, Picardian archers quickly drew, grew to appreciate the compact horn bows of the shoe, since having a small bow with high poundage can be advantageous with the guerrilla tactics employed, not to mention the attacking fortifications and shooting from trees or walls. It took some modification to make them waterproof, but once this was accomplished, the horn bow rapidly became the most popular bow amongst Picardian archers because of the context of the conflict as well as hunting. 
The war ended in a series of treaties which set the more peaceful era of the known world enjoys to this day, but the horn bow is now the standard bow used by Karatoan archers. Karatoan is an order of Picardian warriors and hunters. Making a bow is a rite of passage and requires the acolyte to bring down an animal, typically an antelope, using only an iraku knife to craft their supplies, traps, or weapons. The beast they kill is used to make their bow. Most Picardian nobles are expected to pass the rites, but a majority of Karatoan are commoners. Karatoan are expected to always have their bow and iraku knife, a curved machete, on their person at all times, and be prepared to use them in defense of those under their protection. To voluntarily surrender their arms is a highly disgraceful act. Spears, shields, axes, and other weapons of war are fine to turn over, but for their sacred arms to be surrendered is tantamount to relinquishing their title. As Picardia is a humid climate, they often prefer weapons made of bronze, wood, or obsidian over steel since rust maintenance can be tedious. Especially when hunting, arrowheads of bone, horn, and obsidian are perfectly suitable for the task. They do make steel, but for the most part, it is only used in times of war. Rubber-tipped arrows are sometimes employed in disabling foes, although these shots can still be lethal. These bows are of legendary power. During the Three Spears conflict, there are many records of Picardian arrows shattering against the armor of men-at-arms, and only was this impact of such force that they would be winded, shrapnel of wooden halves and obsidian arrowheads got into gaps in armor and also wounded those around the target. Keratoan bows are often between 100 and 150 pounds in draw weight, but a few individuals have crab bows, a great war bow with an extra limb added for strength that boasts an astonishing 300 pounds in draw weight. The standard armor of Keratoan is reflective of their duties both as warrior and hunter. The cuirass is an intricate piece of equipment made from many layers of lamellar scales of baked leather and bronze. This design looks bulky but is in fact quite flexible. An outer layer of tree fiber not only adds color and decoration, but also protects the pieces from weathering. The leather is often used from beasts they kill, so some prefer to wear their cuirass open. A keratone usually keeps a number of spare scales to replace the armor if it is damaged in the field. A sturdy neck guard protects the back of the neck from the likes of Gotwat landing a kill, as these monkeys are notorious for attacking from the back and biting the necks of unsuspecting chimerans. The braces they wear are mostly to protect their arms from bowstring. The chaps they wear as leg protection is also made of hardened leather with sorts of articulation points that protect them from the brush as much as animal attacks. This leather is also made from beasts that they kill. Rolanix, crown prince of the Picardian Confederacy, wears chaps made from the hippopotamus he killed when he became Keratoan. When the Keratoan go to war, they enhance their kit accordingly. Keratoan shields are, like their armor, made from segmented layers of baked leather and bronze. It is built around the central pole ending in a hook and is used more as a parrying stick than a static block of projectiles, although this can offer such defense. It will also add helmets and shoulder plates. Usually they use their bow as the primary weapon, but when they engage, a spear slung over the shoulder is the typical melee weapon. The Picardian Axe is a weapon favored by Keratoan who like to engage in melee in tight spaces and in maritime combat. Imperial and Republic records describe these weapons as capable of punching through mail or thin plates, especially when made of steel. Soldiers of the Kajarath Republic are often armed with pole arms as their primary weapon, a sidearm like a sword or axe, and have many ranged weapons. Some Kajaraths still practice archery but generally the crossbow is the preferred distance weapon. The armies of the Republic are comprised of three sorts of fighting men. Regular soldiers who fight directly for the Republic, militias who fight for the nobles who own their land, and the mercenary companies each individually hired either by lords to join their militia or as a faction of the Republic army. There have been many advancements in crossbow design over the years. Perhaps the most famous is the winged crossbow, a weapon originally developed in Qajar and currently produced in great quantities by the Free State's Boyer Guilds, and is the standard issue for Republic sharpshooters. The army of the Chakati Empire reflects the highly diverse composition of imperial cultures. 
Many cavalry, especially those of Shu descent, have retained their light armor of their ancestors along with horn bows and their iconic saber axe, an unwieldy but devastating cutter which, in conjunction with their archers, excels in the context of the hit-and-run tactics which won the Chakati almost every open engagement they were involved in. Although the Shu keep this tradition, many Imperial troops maintain their weapons and methods that they used before. The Telmed peoples of the Eastern Imperial Highlands were notorious as a regularly warring collection of provinces for thousands of years. Their martial arts, tactics, and kit are widely considered the best in the world. Although this region has had many dynasties, it was the city-state of Utkubmit which united the provinces shortly before the arrival of the Chakati, and this invader from the north aided in the consolidation of all of the remaining providence against a common foe. The Chakati eventually defeated them through a combination of surrounding them with mercenary ships and cutting off land trade, but the Mountain Telmede proved their reputation for martial prowess, securing many victories when the Chakati did lay siege. But Kubmatir bows are asymmetrical for the effective use over battlements and shooting down at foes far below. The shape did prove useful as the troops were integrated into Imperial cavalry, although Kudmatir archers are often put in charge of defending Imperial fortifications. Although not as famous, their infantry is also quite proficient, having slightly more armor and primarily using a polearm and shield. As one of the few regions in Chimera with substantial iron deposits, these peoples are quite proficient metalworkers. Far and away the best metallurgists in Chimera are the Smiths of Trist, one of the Talmud city-state provinces. The Trist do not disclose their methods, but their work is quite similar to techniques employed by the first children of the Second Age, made of comparable quality despite lacking magic. The core is of spring steel and braided to have a rigid structure, making for a blade that will hold form during cut or thrust, but when it does compress, has sufficient tensile strength that it'll spring back to form. Armor of Trist steel employs the same technique, being strong of form but flexible in material composition. The Tristir see the greatest value in simple-looking blades, their function and effectiveness being paramount. However, their economy is based around commission, and nobles and pirate kings will pay the worth of a castle for a Trist story, and these blades are often highly ostentatious and personalized, sometimes heavily compromising function in favor of customized aesthetic. The Tristir might scoff at some of these designs that they craft, but grumble all the way to the bank. All cultures have their own martial forms, but the stances of Utkubmatir martial arts have been integrated throughout the known world. There are generally regarded to be six forms, although as many as 22 are explored by various Telmed schools. The first form is the neutral form, or water stance. This form emphasizes adaptability, neither too stationary or mobile, aggressive or defensive. Water might be regarded as the simplest and least exciting form, but masters of water stance are formidable in their adaptability, often dominating their foes, able to adjust and adapt to any context. Air stance, or form 2, is quite similar to water, although emphasizes mobility. It also tends to favor a more offensive style. This mobility requires a great deal of flexibility, strength, and above all endurance to execute properly, making it deceptively difficult to become proficient in. Air masters are often called war dancers, running circles around their opponents and being arguably the best against multiple opponents, as it predisposes the fencer to keep mobile and avoid getting pinned down. Form 3, or Fire Stance, is fully invested in offense. The aim of this form is to overwhelm a flow with a flurry of strikes. It is mobile like air, but a Fire Fencer is focused on closing the distance as quickly as possible and attacking without care for mercy or defense, considering a defense unnecessary when the opponent is overwhelmed. Fire is the favorite stance of Intermediate Fencers, and many legends are told of Fire Masters rapidly and decisively ending their foes, but many masters consider fire to be an irresponsible and relatively easy to counter and repost against due to its complete disregard for defense. That said, this form is perhaps the best for an inexperienced center going up against a master, since the movement and powerful attacks make for a confident likelihood of scoring several hits, even if your opponent parries most of them. As a Talmud fire master once said, the defender needs to succeed every time. The attacker needs succeed only once. Earth Stance, or Form 4, is a defensive stance. 
It is a static form with the fencer taking up a strategic position, low stance, and refusing to move. Some consider Earth to be the best form against multiple opponents, but this only applies to situations wherein the fencer can assume a strong defensive position, whereas air is a lot more flexible. Earth is often preferred with weapons that have respectable reach, seeking to defend as wide an area as possible. Often earth weapons are non-lethal, with earth swords, for example, having a sharp tip, but primarily being employed as a parrying stick. Form 5, or ice, is the offensive counterpart to earth. It is also a stationary form, but the fencer seeks to parry and repost incoming strikes. Most regard this as perhaps the most difficult to master, as it requires patience and a great deal of skill in its attacks, since each must be incorporated in parrying incoming strikes, but when defending important locations such as a choke point from an invading force, ice has earned itself a formidable reputation. Form 6, or Lightning Stance, is built around the philosophy of energy conservation and ending the fight in a single lethal strike. Typically, Lightning Stance involves a long period of assessment, accounting for as many variables as possible before even considering strike placement. Duels between Lightning Masters are famously represented by a parable of Masters who spent three days on a mountaintop simply assessing the other. When the clash came, both Masters made a single strike, and the victor correctly predicted the strike of his opponent and placed his blade so the anticipated attack was parried. As this system of martial arts has spread throughout the known world, it has become integrated in many existing systems of combat. The Picardian, for example, have built their system around animals, and incorporate this martial arts has resulted in a fusion of martial arts styles, wherein fire stance has been replaced by hippopotamus, air with firebird, earth with viper, and lightning with heron. In order to vanquish a demon or homunculus, magic is almost always required to finish the job, and for a mortal with no witchcraft or skin-changing magic, enchanted weapons are the only reliable method. The first children made many weapons with enchantments, but their arms and arm are entirely too small to be used by humans or chimerans, and in the later years of their reign, they simply used homunculi for combat rather than arming themselves. Most surviving enchanted artifacts were made during the Age of Witches and are crafted of common styles at the time, usually made of bronze or organic materials. A few enchanted weapons were said to be crafted by the Undying, an ancient spirit said to be either a homunculus or perhaps even a late surviving first child. They are made using far more sophisticated techniques, most notably being a slightly porous material that the swarms of magic can use to crawl through the space throughout the weapon, increasing their effectiveness. The Asnarath are an order of witch hunters based in Kajar. The order claims their weapons fell from the sky and were gifts from the gods to vanquish evil, although it is very likely that they are instead some sort of relic of the first children. The weapons are mutable in size and form, and there is their partners attuned to them over time. The magic of their weapons pairs with and enhances the hereditary magic and witchcraft magic of the Asnarath, making both weapon and knight more powerful. The bond between Asnarath and Blade is the relationship that takes a long time but a great advantage of this connection is that the weapon has thousands of years of combat experience. Other enchanted weapons are best to carefully attune to, since ultimately weapons are designed to kill and they can always get a new host. As Elijah learns in The Lost Hellfighter, humans make for especially powerful hosts. They have no magic of any kind, no defenses against the control of their weapon, and therefore human bodies are pretty effectively controlled and enhanced as hosts. The healing factor of demons and homunculi has resulted in most weapons specializing in their dispatch having heavy cutting blades. Sarkazuko, the enchanted sword that bonds with Elijah and the Lost Hellfighter, was inspired by basically a robust version of the 1796 Light Cavalry Saber, which I have admired at a distance for a long time and was lucky enough to stumble upon one in an antique shop in Vermont a few weeks ago. Elijah describes the blade as being unwieldy and front heavy. Sarkasuka would be pretty rubbish in the context of fencing against human foes if it wasn't for the supernatural strength it grants, and the injuries it deals are quite frankly overkill for a human foe, but it's just the sort of weapon you'd want if your opponent is 9 feet tall, rocks a nasty head of a marine reptile, and has diamond dust in its skin. 
In a world so fraught with danger, it should come as no surprise that Chimerians have a wide range of arms and armor that they must invest in. Shout out to Joe for sponsoring this episode. Chimere is a setting with a lot of sword and sorcery adventure stories, so I was of course extremely excited to get into this topic. There's a ton of action scenes in the next anthology, so having this episode to discuss the weapons, armor, and martial arts was fun and helpful. I also want to call out my consultant, Gabriel Pottebaum, a HEMA instructor who has been kind enough to discuss some of the designs of Chimere's arms and armor with me. You can find some of his tournaments and instruction videos at the Sinister Swordsman YouTube channel. Next week is Big Bug Week, as hosted by Paleo Curiosities on Instagram. I'll be talking about the Trident Scorpions, a diverse clade of scorpions that returned to the seas of Chimere back during the First Dynasty. Although they aren't as diverse as they once were, these arachnids still have some exceptional specimens in the known world and beyond, including the largest arthropod ever to evolve on Earth or Chimere. That's it for today! Shout out to my patrons for your continued support, cheers to Joe, and thank you all for watching. Stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks.